I think it helped me to like find my path. I'm happy to be a writer and to share what I know with others and to learn from them. So, so, it's a good thing. Welcome to Queries, Qualms, and Quirks, the weekly podcast that asks published authors to share their successful query letter and discuss their journey from first spark to day of publication. I am your host, Sarah Nicholas. I hope you're enjoying the podcast and the stories authors are sharing with you. If you are, please consider leaving a review on your podcast app or sharing the episode on social media. And if you're interested in supporting the show with a couple bucks a month, go to patreon.com slash pub talk live. Today, you're going to hear from author Abby L. Vandiver, Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestselling author Abby L. Vandiver, also writing as Abby Collette, has penned more than 30 novels and short stories. She is a hybrid author being traditionally and self-published. Abby writes cozy mysteries and has a women's fiction book, Where Wild Peaches Grow, coming in August 2022. She lives in Cleveland, Ohio. So please welcome Abby to the show. Hello. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, thanks so much for coming on. I'm really excited to talk about your journey to publication today. I'm happy to talk about that. Awesome. So let's go all the way kind of back to the beginning. When did you first start getting interested in writing and how long did it take from that point until you got serious about pursuing publication? So my writing journey started out, uh, I guess, differently, finding out that I was a good writer I decided to be a lawyer. So I wrote briefs and motions and pleadings. And, you know, they have to be persuasive. I was the top of my class in research and legal research and writing and law school. But I never thought of doing it, you know, a fiction book. Although, you know, some may argue that legal writing is sort of fiction. (laughs) Uh, But... (laughs) But I never thought about it until I got sick. I was very sick for about four years and the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And for the most part, I was bedridden. I couldn't get out of the bed, but my mind was fine. And all I did was worry about, oh, what's wrong with me? And I needed something to take my mind off of it. And my daughter called one day just out of the blue and she said, mommy, I found your book in my garage. And I'm thinking, is this an old library book? What kind of book did she find? And it was a book that I had written like 12 years before. Wow. I had lost a job and I came home. I was taking care of my 82 year old mother. I came home and I told her I lost my job. And she says, oh, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to write a book. So I did that and then just put it away. That was in like 1998 or 1997 or something. That was the book my daughter was talking about. And I thought, oh, this will give me something to do. It was all nicely bound at um, (laughs) Kinko's back then it was called. And I decided I could make an electronic copy of it. That would give me something to do. I could go back and review the story that I'd written. And I remember I shared it with my mom every time I'd write a chapter or two. So that was a good memory. And then after I did it, I thought, hey, maybe I could do something with this. And I put it up on a site and got comments and there were our rules to writing, which I had no idea about, but people schooled me on this site. Um, it was a Harper Collins site called Autonomy back in 2011, 2012. Uh, they don't have that site anymore, but you could post your uh, story. People would read it and critique it. And then someone said, why don't you publish this? And I thought, okay, but it was just going to be the one time thing, uh, I was going to put the book up, but people enjoyed it and asked, so when's the next book coming out? And I remember (laughs) thinking, what next book? And that's how I got started. Once you decided that you wanted to publish books and even publish more books after that first one, how did you learn more about publishing? How did you learn how it works and how to go about it and everything like that? Oh, I studied. I would sit chin cupped in the hand and stare at the screen, especially the Amazon pages, did their description pages. And I'd find authors that um, were selling a lot of books. And then I'd research and try to see what are they doing. I'd go to their websites. I'd look at their Twitter and Facebook pages to see what are they tweeting out? What are, are they saying that they're doing anything? And I studied really hard, not only the craft of how to write, 
publishing for Amazon is super easy. So if anyone out there listening wants to self-publish Amazon and most online uh, retailers that publish your books, make it super easy for you. So that wasn't a, a big deal, but the marketing and the writing part, you know, I had to learn that. And so I studied, I got into online community groups and I spoke with other writers. I asked questions or I read their posts because writers are very helpful to each other. Mm -hmm. So people would share the things that they've you know, learned along the way, uh, as I do now. I think that's so important. Um, and I always tell people to get into a writing community, not necessarily you know, a critique group, but a group of writers because we share information. So when I first put my first book up, I put it up in June and I sold no books. And then in July, I sold no books. Mm. And in August, I sold five books. So I was getting the hang of it. <laughs> I had five sales. And then in September, I sold 522 books. Oh, wow. And at that time, yeah, Amazon would pay you 60 days later. They still pay you 60 days later, but you had to have made at least a hundred dollars in that month, in one month, and then sixty days later they would pay you the hundred dollars. So of course in September I did I made that with the five hundred and twenty two sales. November twenty thirteen I got my first check from Amazon and I have not missed a month yet getting a check from them. Nice. So yeah, so it, that's good. Um I certainly my checks have varied in amounts uh because if you're not marketing that book, you're not selling that book. Yeah, I think it is very easy to put a book on Amazon. It's very easy to make a book available for sale. But the hard part is getting people to actually buy it. <laughs> yes, I always say that when you write a book and you put it up on Amazon, that's like dropping it in a sea, you know, of nine million books, you know, and how can you find your, how can a reader find your book? So I also always say that putting out a book is only 10% writing and 90% marketing. You have to market in order to get to navigate your book through that sea of, you know, nine, 10 million, maybe more. Uh, that's just the number I always use books so that people can see it and people will buy it. Mm -hmm. You are also now traditionally published. So can you tell us about how that came about? So I have been told not to ever tell that story because it's not like the typical story. So you have to promise not to tell anyone else, but I'm so I'm going to tell you. Okay. No one else except for the people listening to the podcast. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully thousands of people, right? <laughs> so I was self-publishing and as I said, I had been sick. And so I would write on and off when I was feeling better, I would write. I had written three books, did very well on those three books. I had made thousands of dollars in just three months on those three books. And I was selling them for 99 cents. And Amazon, if you sell a book for 99 cents, they keep seven, about 70 cents of it and you get the other 30 cents. I was sick for maybe a year or more. But when I came back, I had a, another book in hand, ready to sell it, ready to make all this money like I had with the uh, previous three books. And it wouldn't sell. And so I asked a friend, I said, so what's going on? How are we selling books? I, I'm doing all the things we I, I used to do and it isn't selling. And she said, well, Abby, I'm doing all the things you taught me. So that didn't help because I was trying that. But then she added, but now you need an email subscription list. I said, oh, so I had to figure out, you know, again, how to do that. And someone told me that small a publishing press uh, was called Henry Press. It still is called that because they're still open. They only publish cozy mysteries. So they said that they do giveaways and you have to sign up and you have to be accepted, but they took self-published books. Um, They accepted self-published books in their giveaway. And once they would accept you, you'd be among 23, 24 other authors and they would just have a contest a giveaway, not necessarily a contest. You would put in your email address at their website and you would be entered into the raffle copter or the giveaway. And uh, if you won, then you got a copy of all the books. If you got second place, you got 10 books or something like that. So I submitted my book because at the end of it, they were given the authors who participated 
the email address of every participant. And someone told me I got 3,000 names from them, you know, for my email. So I thought, oh, I need that. I I have zero email subscribers right now. 3,000 would just be awesome. So I entered it about a week later. I I got um, approval to be in the getaway uh, giveaway. And then about a week after that, they contacted me and said, we'd like to publish your book. Mm. I thought, what? You want to publish my book? And they wanted to publish the book that I gave them, which had five other books in that series. And I told them, no, that's my income. You know, I uh, don't want to do that. So they said, tell you what, write four chapters of another book. If we like it, then we'll give you a three book series. And sure enough, they liked what I wrote. And that's my Romaine Wilder mystery series. Uh, there's three books in that series. And before it came out, the first book came out in June 2018. And in April of 2018, so a couple months before it even came out, an agent contacted me. Hmm. And I didn't think it was real because I had heard, I'd never thought about being a traditional author because I didn't think I could do it. You know, there's this stigma with self-published used to be, you know, they say, well, if you're self-publishing, that means you're not good enough to be traditionally published. And not that I didn't think I wasn't good enough because in my mind, I can do everything (laughs) um, or anything, but I just didn't think of it. I was happy self-publishing. And so I remember telling the librarian at my local library, she runs the writing center there. Uh, I said, you know, I got the craziest email. Someone said they were an agent and they wanted to represent me. I go, I know that was fake. She said, well, you know, what was the name? Well, the person's name, what was the agency name? And I told her, you know how librarians, they can always put their finger <laughs> on the right book, you know? So she walks over to her shelf and she pulls out this marketplace book or something, this thick catalog that came out yearly. And she said, sure enough, here it is. There's, you know, the person that contacted you. And that was Rachel Brooks. And so my librarian friend told me, you should email her back because this just might be real. So I did. I emailed her back and we spoke on the phone for about an hour. And while we were talking, I got very excited. I thought, oh, what the heck? Maybe I should have an agent. That would be so cool to have an agent. And so I asked at the end of the conversation, I said, so what would I need to do for you to be my agent? Because I didn't have any anything that she could sell at the time. I I hadn't written anything other than what I was, what Henry Press was going to published. And she said, I'm going to send you a contract and you sign it. And that's all I had to do. I didn't have to, I didn't show her a writing sample. She couldn't have seen my book with Henry Press because it wasn't out yet. I don't know if she ever read maybe one of my older books that was self-published. She never Mm -hmm. said, and I didn't ask because I didn't want her to think twice. You know, (laughs) well, (laughs) She emailed me a contract. I didn't even read it, which is terrible as a lawyer. Don't tell anyone that either. As a former lawyer, I should have read every word and scrutinized it. I just printed it all out and turned to the last page and signed it and scanned it in and sent it back to her. Wow. And that's how I got an agent. Yeah, that is certainly a different story (laughs) from what we usually hear. But, you know, I didn't know so much that it was that different until I I started saying it to other people. And one author uh, told me, she said, don't tell people that. (laughs) (laughs) You'll upset people because some people have been looking for agents for a long time. But what I say to people is don't give up, you know, even maybe because I had it easier, you know, I still had to show my worth and, you know, write a book for my agent to submit, but it, it'll come. It'll come. Just keep trying. Yeah, your path to getting an agent is probably a path that I would say is a possibility, but probably not a good plan. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah, don't plan that one's going to come. You know, even for my first publishing deal, you know, people were saying, you got a publishing deal and you didn't have an agent and you didn't query anyone for that either. So yeah, my, my journey is a little different. But I think that's a good thing to see Mm -hmm. um, because there are different ways. I have friends who went to BoucherCon and Malice Domestic not and didn't have an agent and met, sat down next to someone in a bar and started talking. And that's how they got their agent. So there's lots of different ways. You know, yeah, you're in the trenches, but think about networking. You know, that a lot of times will get you there. They have writing conferences where they will 
have editors and agents come um, and to critique your work. And sometimes agents say, I'd like to see this. And then there's all those Twitter uh, pitch wars, DV pit, things that you can get an agent as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I uh, contacted you about being on the podcast, mm -hmm. you said, well, I don't really have a query letter. Someone reached out to me. Do you still want me on the podcast? And I was like, <laughs> yes, like I would love to represent a variety of experiences. Yeah. It's been funny because I've been recording podcasts this week and I was looking for a good one to start out with, right? To to be the first one that's published. I, I was trying to aim for one that's kind of like the standard path, right? right. And so far I haven't found one. <laughs> <laughs> See, so there's no, I don't think there's a standard path anymore. Probably it used to be, but anymore it's not, you know, but you should still, uh, query letters are still a good thing. Yes. Uh, my agency, which is Bookends, a uh, literary agency, you can go on YouTube and find, they do videos for writing query letters, what you should put in query letters, how agents review the query letters what it means when they ask you for, you know, rewrite or resubmit, or should you try again if you get rejected? So it's really good information and query letters are, are something that you should, you know, look into. I practiced and wrote a query letter, not that I needed one, but if someone asked me about it and I thought, well, I've never written one. So let me write one. And I did a little research and I just writ wrote something that I don't even know would get me in the door, but at least I can say, I know what goes in it and what you should do. Query letters definitely work. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's always interesting to hear other paths to publication. Yeah. Okay. So how has your experience been since signing your contract with your publisher? Was there anything that you felt like was really different in the process between when you were self-publishing and when you were with your publisher? When I first was traditionally published, I was so excited. It was kind of like with the experience with my agent. I just want to sign, you know, show me where to sign. I, and they were super nice to me. I had heard so many things before because it takes a really long time for the process. We were able to sell the story uh, in January, but I didn't get even get a contract till April, I, I believe. Um, so it was a long time in between. And of course, I asked questions to everyone I knew. It's a different community, traditionally published authors and self-published authors. It's a whole different community. I haven't found much of a crossover either between the two. There are a lot of authors are now being both. Uh, they're hybrid authors like I am. Not a lot, but I, I should say a trend is kind of starting. So uh, everything was new and bright and shiny to me. I noticed that in self-published, you know, I had m more control of when I get the money. Mm. You know, once I signed the contract, uh, I'm used to not waiting any longer than 60 days on Amazon for them to pay me, you know, for that, for that event. Uh, certainly every month, like I said, I, I received a check. So that was kind of weird, but you do get a lot up front. Now, my first traditionally published book, the Romaine Wilder series, I didn't get an advance because, as I said, Henry Press is a small press. But when I got the deal with Penguin, I got an advance. And so, you know, you're waiting, you're planning for that money because, you you know, you've got this nice advance coming and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And it doesn't come. You know, it doesn't come. The contract doesn't come. So I asked my agent because I didn't know the process. She says, your contract is in queue. So you know what that means. I mean, how many times you call someplace, you know, and you're in queue. You're number 36. <laughs> I was thinking I must be like 1 million and 36, you know, in a penguin queue. So, you know, that's one thing that I found was different. People were saying, oh, your cover, you have no control. But Penguin, and I, I published under Berkeley. Oh my gosh, they have been so awesome with the cover. They always ask my input even before starting the cover. And after a cover is done, they ask me, what do I think? What colors do I like? Is this okay? The first cover they sent me, I didn't like. And everyone was like, you're just stuck with it. They're not going to change it. But I wrote to my editor and said, I didn't like it. And she said, no problem. So I've had really good experiences. And uh, so far, 
with things and it's different as i said different arenas and the money situation is different but and their deadlines i made self imposed deadlines when i self published just because otherwise you'll write forever and never get your book out if you don't say i'm going to put this book out on a certain day um but you have deadlines but it's so awesome because you have an editor i don't have to go searching for an editor who's a good editor how much do they charge you know it's all a package deal that's why i think that i stick to being a hybrid because it's the best of both worlds and you write under two pen names mhm do you want to talk about a little bit about how that came about and why you decided to do that right and i'm i'm going to write in a, under a third name as well so Abby Vandiver is actually a pen name that is not my real name although Vandiver is my maiden name and I wrote probably 20 books by the time that I got with Penguin now Henry Press didn't mind at all they took me as I was as I am but when I got to Penguin they said well we're going to do a contract with you write under Abby Vandiver but we don't want you to write anything else under that name because we don't want to compete right you know we're giving you money we're going to make this beautiful book for you and when it comes out we don't want other books out at the same time under your name so i thought well i still want to self publish maybe i could come up with a new name and just use it as ping with penguin and they said that was fine and i had heard that you should pick a name your last name that's in the first half of the alphabet because that's where you will fall on library shelves and in bookstores So I came up with Colette and actually Colette is my real middle name. Mm. So and it started with a C. So that kept me, you know, in the right area. And they were fine with that. So I can write now other books under Abby Vandiver, although there's they still have the first refusal. So even if I write a cozy mystery, I have to under Abby Vandiver, I still will go to them to see if they want to publish it under Abby Colette. and if not then i'm free to publish it and then i decided to write a women's fiction i don't know why <laughs> first i thought i could write a rom-com but i start blushing when i type books about kissing so i figured i i can't do that and so i decided to write a women's fiction i wrote four chapters of it and my agent was able to sell it to lake union which is an imprint of amazon It is completely different from my cozy mysteries. You know, in cozy mysteries, there are certain requirements. I guess you could say, uh, no graphic sex or violence. The murder happens off stage. You always have an amateur sleuth, and you know they're fun and light and offer often humorous. And now I'm writing a woman's fiction. I don't want someone to see Abby Vandiver and Abby Collette and say, you know, one of my readers and say, oh. you know i always read her books let me pick this one up and then they open it and it's like what is this you know this is completely different so the best thing i think to do is if you're writing in different genres you should have a different name although i'm writing in cozy mysteries and i have two different names it was only at the request of my editor i have asked someone else who was self published and also got a contract with berkley why didn't they change their name and they said they negotiated that um not to do that. So I don't know if when she negotiated it did she lose out on something else? I don't know. So things happen differently for different people and it's kind of like what makes you happy and that's the good thing with an agent. They could do all that negotiation for you. Yeah, I was going to ask you did your agent kind of help in those different processes either with Penguin or with the new women's fiction book? Did she help you kind of navigate you know the the contract language and the choosing a different pen name and that all those different compromises well you know how before i said i think i know everything so i always think i know just as much as my agent which i do not <laughs> so i'm always jumping in there try try to do stuff and she is so patient with me i probably would have gotten rid of me eons ago but you know i i was a an attorney uh so i know how to read contracts and but yes she actually negotiated she tell me we got the deal but i need to get you this and that and that's fine with me and then when i first started i didn't know things like my book went to auction i didn't know what that meant of course i knew the general sense of the word auction but in literary terms i didn't and then it was preempted and i didn't know what that meant you know so she explains all those things to me and i don't ever see the contract and say 
okay, yeah, I want this or that, even though I understand it. A lot of people may not, you know, can grasp the legalese of it all as quickly, but she didn't ever say, what do you think, Abby? You know, I know you have a background in contracts. Uh, what do you think? She never said that. She told me, I'm going to work this out. We're going to get this and this. And sometimes she would come back. She'd say, okay, for like for the second contract I got, she said, this is what they offered. Uh, what do you think? And I'd say yay or nay. And if I say nay, then she goes, okay, we'll go back and we'll say this. But other than that, she did all the negotiation herself. And, and then she'd tell me, okay, it's good to sign. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, certainly I could go over it, but I trust her. And that's what they do. They have all the experience and she talks to them. When I told her I wanted another book deal, my first book with Penguin hadn't even come out. So they had no idea if I'd make any kind of sales for them. And my agent told me she emailed them every week because, you know, they didn't, they either didn't answer her or didn't give her the, the right answer. And finally they said, okay, fine. <laughs> what does Abby have? <laughs> what can she write a story about? And she negotiated that whole thing too. And I have another book series with Berkeley that uh, the first book comes out December 7th. It's called Body and Soul Food. Mm. It's a books and biscuits mystery. And it's about um, a set of fraternal twins that were separated when they were very young, was, was adopted, and one grew up in foster care and in group homes. And they meet as adults. And that's when the story starts. And they open a bookstore, combo, uh, soul food cafe. And that one's coming out, like I said, in December. And I got that deal before, no, I think right after my first book came out um, with them, A Deadly Inside Scoop. I've spoken to authors who are um, also lawyers. There are a lot of romance authors specifically who are lawyers. <laughs> That's because we need an outlet from all this <laughs> <Yeah>. stress. <laughs> and they've told me that even though they might, they understand the contract, mm -hmm. especially early on, they understood it, but they didn't know what was kind of a standard term in the industry or a standard, right. you know, concession that one might make in the industry. Right. So the agent does help navigate that. Certainly. But, you know, some things, you know, are good or bad. I remember when I got the, my first contract with, I'm going to whisper, Henry Press. Uh, I remember after I read it, I told someone, I go, you know, I'm signing this. I don't have a problem signing this. But if this was my client, if I was someone's lawyer and they brought that to me, I would tell them, don't sign that. You know? That's a great reason to have an agent, though, because yes. it's harder to make those decisions when you're so personally involved with it. And an agent right. can be a little more objective. Yeah. Yep. I agree. It's great to have an agent and I really appreciate mine. I probably don't show her enough. I, I probably will, will get through with this and send her a card or something. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> I'll send you a snippet of the last like 30 seconds and you can okay. send it to her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So it is time for the quick round. I call it author DNA. So it's just um, questions that you can answer really quick. And they are things that we often talk about in ways of defining writers. And so we'll see where you stand. Are you more of a pantser or a plotter? Oh, definitely a pantser. Do you tend to overwrite or underwrite? Neither. Neither? I, I think I get it. I only do one draft. Oh, wow. Of a book. So I pretty much have to get it right. That's not to say that my eight, my editor doesn't make some changes, mm -hmm. but I do one draft. That's actually one of the questions on when it comes to a first draft. Are you more of a get it down or get it right kind of person? Yeah, I'm the this is it. <laughs> person. <laughs> are you more of a morning writer or a night writer morning whenever you start a new story does it usually start in your head with character or plot or concept or some other thing character because you know i write cozies i remember i told you there's a formula so it's always a dead body and a murder to be solved so i don't have to worry about plot <laughs> so character do you prefer coffee or tea I don't drink either, and I like oh. both, um, but I, I want to be a tea drinker because it's good for you. So I'm going to say tea, and I'm going to put it out there in the universe. Tea. I drink tea. So it's an aspirational answer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Definitely. When you write, do you prefer silence or some kind of sound? No, I have to have company. So the TV's on or the radio is on. And I'm not a person. I hear some people say, you know, they can't listen to any music with words. 
I sing along with the music that I'm listening to. And lots of times those words end up in my book. What tools or software do you use to draft? Word. Do you prefer drafting or revising more? Drafting. I like drafting more. Mm -hmm. I don't like revising. (laughs) Me neither. (laughs) Do you write in sequential order or do you hop around? I hop around. So when I write, I have chapter one and then all my other chapters are chapter next because I never know when they'll come. I write as I think of stuff and then at the end I can move them around. Sometimes things come out in order, like if it's one scene that's very long and covers, because I like to make really short chapters, like five to nine pages, then, you know, those are in order. But lots of times, yeah, I'm writing chapter 23 and I only have chapter, you know, first two chapters at the beginning. So that's the end of author DNA. So the show is called Queries, Qualms, and Quirks. We skipped the first one because you didn't... (laughs) Right, Corey. But now we're going to go to the second cue. So what were some of the worries that you had along your journey to publication? And were they realized or did you overcome them? Or how did that shake out? Oh, I think that the only worry that I ever have is, am I good enough to write? You know, and I, it's the imposter syndrome and a lots of writers. I dare say most writers have that And that's me. I remember when my women's fiction, it's called Where Wild Peaches Grow. I got the contract. You know, I only wrote the four chapters. So, you know, I'm very sure of myself. (laughs) So thinking then and the announcement came out. And when I read the announcement, oh, my gosh, I panicked. I wrote my agent. I go, I can't write this. You know, it sounded so good. And, and, you know, all these nuances in the I go, I can't do that. So that's my only biggest worry. I I don't worry about selling because I hustle my books. Uh, someone told me, now that you're traditionally published, you can't put books in your trunk to sell them. And I'm thinking, why not? You know, so I don't worry about things like that. But I certainly wonder, can I write? Someone asked me that. When did you realize that you were a writer? When, you, when did you first realize that? And I go, I still don't know that. <sighs> <laughs> wow. All right. And now it's time for the third cue. Do you have any writing quirks? Is there anything about your pro- process that is interesting or unique or different? Yeah. So I tell everyone, don't do what I do. <laughs> I write. I write my uh, books on napkins and the back of envelopes and the back of receipts. One time I was in the hospital and I started writing on a napkin and I was talking to a friend and she was like, oh my goodness. She says, can't the nurse, you know, the nurse station, can't they give you a piece of paper? I said, what? I've got the other side of my napkin still left and dinner's coming. So I'll get another napkin. And then my note, I have notebooks where I take notes and they're up the side and across the top and asterisk and arrows. And then I can write a book in about three weeks. And like I said, I don't do drafts, but I do go back at the beginning of that chapter. I have a friend, Catherine, uh, she's a writer as well. She lives in out in California and we've never met, but we've been friends since 2013 and we read each other's chapters. So if I write the chapter, she reads it out loud. So I'll do that, but that's the end of that. You know? Wow. So I, I, I tell people, I do things really weird I write in order. I write like conversations first, conversations that I hear, conversations that I want in there. And then I try to put them together. And I have this thing where I feel everything, like my names that I think of, I have to feel them. You know, this has to feel right. So I'm not very organized with it. I'm not very traditional with the way I write. So Mm. I'm not a good person for people to say, so how do you write? You know, what should I do? I could tell them mostly like what not to do. Like, don't do what I do. You've had quite a journey. Did you have any time in your journey when you felt discouraged or you felt like you weren't sure if you would keep going with the writing process? No, no, (laughs) I didn't. Because, you know, so I was self-employed when I was an attorney, but it's constant. Even though I had my own law firm, clients were always coming in. This isn't like that. So this is like the perfect, and I'm older. And like I said, I have been sick. And I still have some vestiges of that left. So I think this is like the perfect thing. It it took me getting sick, I guess, 
or getting fired at that time, that very first book I wrote and laid down for 12 years. I don't know. It's, you know how they say it's, things happen for a reason. So all those things at different intervals le- led me here. And I like it. Um, one time I needed something and my daughter was like, are you going to go back to work? How are you going to get that? And I said, all I have to do is write a book. And that's just how I feel. You know, I just have to write a book. And sometimes because I've suffered from depression my entire adult life, sometimes I'm, you know, not motivated. Like when all this stuff happened and we had to stay in the house first few months as I hear lots of writers it happened to. It just wasn't motivated. But other than that, no, I just, you know, sometimes I'll say, okay, I'll write a book. And as I say, I can write a book in about three weeks. So that's what I do. Were there any mistakes that you felt like you made along the way that if you could go back, you would, you would not do that? Yes. So I, I don't feel like that I would go back and change them. I learned from them. So one thing is thinking I could edit stuff myself. And I don't know why I thought that, because even when I was a lawyer and I'd write briefs, you know, I'd have someone read over my brief, my assistant or something, just to make sure I got it correctly, words and things, because they didn't have any idea of the law. They couldn't check that. But, you know, we had to have two spaces between periods and um, you had to have different section headings and things like that. And I, so I don't know why I thought that, but I thought I can read my own book and I can figure out if I'm missing any words, if I have any misspelled words and you cannot, because <laughs> even though that you know the difference in your and your and there and there and there, you still, for some reason, will write the wrong one in, you know, and when you read it, it's in your mind what you want it to write. And that's what you see. Mm-hmm. So I don't know that I would go back because it taught me a lesson. You know how sometimes they say, you have to get burned in order to, you know, to learn to stay away from the fire. So I think, I think I would have gone on my arrogant little way. Oh, I can do this, you know, and not learn that you cannot do that. <laughs> you have to get a proofreader, an editor, I get beta readers. So I think those are things, but everything else I'm still learning. I, I don't think that I know everything. Even when I teach classes, just speaking with other writers or things things that I've gone over before in a previous class and I'm going over it again, it strikes me differently. And I learned something from that. I learned something from other writers all the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm ever learning. That is a great segue into the next question, which is, can you share with listeners one of the most important lessons you learned on your journey to publication? Just something to hang in there with. I was a person that, you know, I didn't hang on to things, you know, long. If I, I did this for a little while, I was a college professor. I taught economics. I was a city registrar. Everyone that was born or died in Cuyahoga County, their certificate had my name on it. You know, I did a lot of things. But at the same time, I was an attorney too. So I think it helped me to like find my path, you know, to be, like I said, where I'm supposed to be. So I think this was a great journey and I'm happy to be a writer and to share what I know with others and to learn from them. So so it's a good thing. I call this part of the podcast the acknowledgement section because this is not a business that most of us succeed in completely on our own. So who are some of the people or even organizations who helped you along the way? South Euclid Library. That's my South Euclid Public Library. That. It's my library where there's a writing center. I just saw the sign and said, oh, writing center. And I wandered in and I met Lori Kenser. And I tell everyone about Lori Kenser because that's the librarian who said, you know, let's look this up and see if it's really a legit agency. And when she found out that I was self-published, she said, bring up, bring your books in. I'll read them and we can either get them catalog or you can, if, if it doesn't meet our standards, then we can have it donated. It just won't be cataloged. And she read my book. She got it cataloged. She got it into all the, because it's a library system, the county library system. She got it into there. So I always tell people about her and she doesn't just do that for me. You know, any writer and poets that go into the South Euclid Lindhurst Public Library, that's a home for them. Someone there to help, uh, resources. And then there's Catherine Dion. That's my uh, writing partner. And then I have an hashtag M writing group. We meet every Friday. We used to meet in the library. Now we meet online. And 
It's a writing community. I'm also in Crime Writers of Color, which is another writer's community, and we talk and we share. So those things are so important. You know, people say that writing is a solitary profession. And sure enough, I've heard of people, I'm in my writing cave, you know, and I can't be disturbed for a couple hours. But yeah, you kind of have to, when you're actually writing, doing that, but you have to have someone to bounce ideas off of, to read what you've written. You know, it's just like you said, in the acknowledgments of any book, the author thanks all the people who took the time to read the book, to give her, to give them feedback on the book you know, countless versions of the book. Those things are all the ways I want to acknowledge. And of course, my agent, last year, I got three book deals. Uh, One, actually, I acted as agent on, but my agent, I couldn't have done it without her. Rachel Brooks and Bookends Literary Agency is a great agency. Jessica Faust is uh, the owner of that agency. And she cares about writers, you know, not just her clients, but all writers. And she's the one who does the YouTube videos. All right. So for listeners who are interested in checking out your books, can you tell us about your last couple of releases? Sure. So I just had um, the second book in my ice cream mystery series, which is my first series with Penguin. It came out March 2nd and it's called A Game of Cones. And then in November, this is the one I acted as agent on, and I will be the editor of an anthology of their all Crime Writers of Color. There are 20 stories in the anthology and Crooked Lane is publishing that. So I'm excited about that. Um, Stephen Mac Jones, who writes the August Snow Mysteries, wrote our foreword. And then, as I said, I have a second series from Penguin and it'll be coming out December 7th, 2021. Uh, And that's um, Body and Soul Food. And then my Where Wild Peaches Grow from Lake Union uh, will come out August 2022. Wow. Awesome. All right, Abby, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Queries, Qualms, and Quirks. You can find links to find out more about Abby and her books in the show notes. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a review on your podcast app, tell your friends, or share this episode on social media. If you're interested in supporting the show with a couple bucks a month, go to patreon.com slash pub talk live. And if you're a published author interested in being a guest on the show, please click on the home base link in the description or go to sarahnicholas.com and click on the podcast logo in the sidebar. That is Sarah with an H and Nicholas with no H. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.